um, spring uh, uh, lecture series here at the uh, at the AA, and also the first in 2008. And if it's not um, uh, bad bad protocol uh, to wish you all a happy new year, I wish you a happy new year. Um, my name is Shaman Basai. I'm uh, the director of the uh, AACP here. Um, and it gives me great pleasure to, to kick this year and um, uh, uh, sort of uh, termly um, talks program off with uh, Nikolai uh, Urasov, who I know many of you already um, know. Um, and I'm hoping we'll get to know uh, a little bit better even this, this evening. Nikolai's come over from New York. Um, and um, also partly uh, in, uh, uh, around the occasion of the exhibition that opens on Friday, which I'd like to invite you all to, which is uh, on Madeleine Riesendorp, the world of Madeleine Riesendorp. Uh, so that's on uh, Friday, um, which the, uh, starts at 6.30 in the evening. So please put that in your diary. Um, and um, how we're going to kind of do this this evening uh, is keep it quite informal and very conversational and there will be only one image um, and you're going to have to wait for that. <laughs> we're going to make you work for your one image. Um, but since uh, what we're going to be talking about so much today is about words and um, language and ideas, we felt that um, we're going to um, focus on those words and languages and ideas and, and not barrage you with, um, with more eye candy. Um, so, the idea is we're going to have a kind of um, maybe 30, 40 minute conversation. I've got a series of topics that I'd like to um, navigate through with, with Nikolai and then um, it would be, we both agreed, uh, it would be really fantastic then to open it up to, uh, to the floor. And there are a number of um, uh, um, people in the audience that uh, I'm sure will have some really interesting questions um, or points even to make, um, given that the topic today is uh, j journalism, write, writing, criticism, uh, and the press. So I've just prepared a, a sort of three minute um, uh, uh, sort of uh, intro as to why, um, why it's important maybe uh, for, for us here at the AA to have invited um, uh, Nikolai um, to, to the AA. Uh, one of the reasons is that uh, look, one can roughly characterize the types of people that I think academic institutions like the AA tend to, tend to invite. On the one hand, uh, there are the sort of genius authors, um, either established or, uh, or, or up, upcoming, um, the, the next great architect or uh, the, uh, the uh, commonly agreed um, superstar. Um, but then there's also the kind of well-seasoned academic and theoretician, who of course is a kind of critic, but um, uh, is not necessarily a critic uh, that, ne uh, that addresses a broader populist and indeed populist and indeed populist audience. And over the last few years, as architecture and design has reached a, gizzy, a giddy uh, Brad Pitt-endorsed popularity and profile in popular culture, so is the attention given by newspapers and general interest or lifestyle magazines. Um, in the UK, um, each of the broadsheets have their own dedicated architecture critic, as does the Evening Standard in London, perhaps still not quite as close to the front page as art featured articles. The output of newspaper-based architecture cr uh, criti critics is definitely... <laughs> That's Mad Maddie's um, ringtone. Uh, is definitely um, more part of the staple diet of culture than perhaps um, uh, ever before. On the one hand, there are stories of the big, uh, the beautiful, the celebrated, the culturally good, the politically important. But there's also the, f uh, the fascination for when architecture goes disastrously wrong, as though the profession of architecture must be ritually and publicly humiliated, pilloried, and demeaned to an extent that is equal and opposite to the, garg to the gargantuan egos of maniacal, hubristic, dictator, best friend star architects. Um, and I did, actually last year, I, did, uh, I compiled um, the number of uh, uh, disaster-related stories in the spate of about 
six months, and there was an extreme, uh, it was an amazing array of uh, uh, swimming pool, uh, roofs collapsing, sports halls collapsing, um, and, uh, and this is something I'd like to talk to Nikolai a bit later on. Um, uh, the press seems to love nothing more than when uh, one of those buildings is designed by a so-called famous architect. So somehow all of those, all that psychic energy seems to come together um, and the kind of, the, 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 uh, the, the genius architect gets his or her comeuppance. Um, since 2004, Nikolai has held perhaps the most prestigious and uh, widely read architecture critic position at the New York Times. Um, and uh, so it gives me great pleasure and I'd like us all to welcome Nikolai Urasov here this evening. Thank you, Nikolai. Thank you. Perhaps I haven't prepared um, a uh, official biography of you because I thought it might be nicer to just ask you um, to describe, uh, uh, perhaps just to kick things off, your own trajectory up to 2004. Um, uh, I mean, leading up to the times. Leading up to the, the times, that's right. Well, I mean, it wasn't particularly well planned out, but um, I'm... I'm I started in journalism at the Times without, well, my father was an architect, so I've had an interest in architecture for a long time and spent a lot of time on construction sites. But I started out um, with the plan of becoming a journalist um, uh, after graduating from university. I went to work at the Times, oddly enough, and then left to go to architecture school. And then um, while I was uh, getting my master's, I was at Columbia um, when uh, someone that you're all familiar with, Bernard Chumi, was there, was running the school. Um, I started writing about various themes inside the profession for the Times, and so it's one of those things where um, uh, my interest in architecture, my interest in writing just seemed to dovetail. And I was lucky enough to kind of be able to turn it into, make a living off of it eventually. Um, but, uh, I mean, just you took in terms of the strict biography, I mean, I w uh, went from, from Columbia wrote for uh, various uh, magazines, Art Forum, New York Observer, The New York Times, um, any magazine that would basically pay me, um, El Decor, Harper's Bazaar, you know, Vanity Fair, um, and then was lucky enough to get hired by the LA Times as a full-time critic, so that's where I began my career as a, as a newspaper critic. And I was there for seven, eight years, and then came to the New York Times, so. And um, because uh, perhaps after the New York Times position, the LA Times um, architecture critic position is also one of the more high profile ones in the States, is it not? Well, there are very few. I mean, it's in terms of we were going to talk at some point <coughs> about the difference between criticism here and criticism there. I mean, there are very few full time positions uh, for an architecture critic at a daily newspaper in the United States. I mean, there, there's, there are four uh, major papers that have full time critics. Um, the Chicago Tribune, the LA Times, the New York Times. The Boston Globe has a wonderful critic who's not even uh, technically on staff. And so he's paid as a freelancer and has to find other ways to make his living. So um, in terms of, of the history of architecture criti criticism in the States, uh, it has a very short history. The first critic in the United States was one of my predecessors, A. Louise Huxtable, and she was appointed in 1962 at a moment when preservation was the biggest issue um, going on in New York, and that was a big part of her focus. Um, that was at, at the, uh, when they were, uh, had uh, demolished Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania Station and were threatening to demolish Grand Central and things like that. So it has a very, very short history in the United States. Mm -hmm. um, there are very few places that have a critic. When I was hired at the LA Times, they hadn't had an architecture critic in um, more than 10 years. And it was only because the Getty Center and Disney Hall were about to open up that they suddenly realized that they needed somebody to be able to write a review of them. And so they started looking for a critic. So it's, I mean, it's interesting in terms of if you look at the history of art criticism in the United States or film criticism, I mean, the Times has three full times art critics, and I'm the only architecture critic there. Um, so, and, and the, the boundaries are also very different in terms of what I cover, but we'll talk about that, I'm sure, sure. later. Yeah. So maybe, I think it'd be quite interesting to talk about the, the history of this position at, at, at the New York Times from, 
because uh, Ada Louise Huxtable, mm -hmm. as you say, established the position and very much also established um, uh, uh, almost a paradigm of what an architecture critic was for a while. Yeah. Um, and a, a certain kind of writerly style and even a certain kind of critical poise. Mm -hmm. um, could you maybe, for those of us who are not so familiar uh, of, of that, also how that related to a particular era of, of architectural production? Well, I think, um, I mean, Ada Louise was kind of the classic, I mean, critic in terms of the way she, she, she you know, she, she wrote as, and still writes occasionally for the Wall Street Journal. She's, we're all still around, oddly enough. There have been four critics at the time, but I'm the fourth, so. But, you know, she, she wrote in the voice of the kind of omnipotent observer, mm -hmm. you know, as someone who, you know, she, she, she reviewed buildings in a, I don't want to say in a narrow sense, but in the most kind of classical sense of what that means um, in terms of, you know, thumbs up, thumbs down, scale, context, material, all of that structure. And uh, Paul Goldberger, who was a critic for much longer, um, who followed in her footsteps, pretty much followed on in that tradition, although was maybe a little bit more uh, wishy-washy in his opinions than she was. And I think that the, the big shift came um, from that that point of view as a critic, um, when my predecessor, who recently died, Herbert Mouchamp, took the position over. And he held it for about 12 years. And, and what was interesting about Herbert, and we were very good friends, was that, um, I mean, he was a mentor to me. Um, he, he wrote in a very subjective voice. I mean, his stories tend to be much more personal than, than the traditional newspaper critic. Um, he talked about himself. Uh, uh, writing as a gay man. He talked about himself in terms of his own personal experiences with the buildings he was writing about. And the criticism against Herbert was that in some sense maybe he didn't care as much about the buildings as he did about some of the ideas that surrounded the buildings. But at the same time, uh, I think it was very liberating for criticism, not just in architecture, but in the United States in general, because um, it took the weight of that sense of omnipotence off of people's shoulders, you know. Um, and um, it, allowed, uh, it allowed for a sense that this was, that there were different kind of points of view in terms of how you look at things, but that the relationship between the building um, and the critic could be something that was very, very personal. A lot of people objected to it, and a lot of people felt very uncomfortable, uncomfortable with it, but I think it was a very powerful powerful position to take and very unusual position to take as a critic. Um, and I think it made a lot of critics in the United States rethink the way they wrote. You know, and that includes art critics and a lot of other critics who were writing at the time, a lot of his colleagues who felt very uncomfortable with what he was doing. It was, for so me, it was only in, in um, the past, the recent passing away of Herbert Mouchamp that I, uh, I did a little bit of, uh, well, actually reading the, the obituary that you, uh, mm -hmm. you, you wrote very soon after his death. A little known fact, I certainly didn't know that Herbert studied here at the AA yeah. um, and, and uh, in the uh, early 70s, I, I, I believe. Well, he studied in a lot of places. Yeah. He kind of never, he kind of drifted from school to school. I don't think he ever finished up anywhere, which is very <laughs> Herbert. Uh, but, um, but he was here for a couple of years, mm -hmm. yeah. And I got, I got um, his first book, uh, which is called File Under Architecture, mm -hmm. and it has a really stunning opening Mm -hmm. Paragraph, which I'm just going to read out here, which is sure, actually yeah. great, which I think somehow in, uh, begins uh, to uh, uh, really characterize a certain, mm -hmm. uh, certain his idiosyncratic voice. So this is at the very beginning of File Under Architecture, which is published in 1974. And Mouchamp says, I'm an architect who has neither designed nor built any buildings nor has the inclination to do so. I call myself an architect purely out of the cosmic conceit, which is all, all that remains of the Western and architectural tradition. Buildings have such short lifespans nowadays, and few bother to look at them anyway. Last year's cosmic, comical, conceptual designs are forgotten with the appearance of the new spring line. Books last longer, take up more space, are easier to take care of, make better gifts than most buildings. In the very last analysis, architecture is not a very highly evolved state of mind, and I am an architect without architecture. <laughs> and which is great. And there's another yeah. line a few paragraphs later where he says, there is no building that is more interesting than a pile of new magazines on the floor. 
Right. And, um, and, and the other thing is uh, Mouchamp at that time was um, uh, part of the, uh, the, the ecology that was uh, Andy Warhol's factory. Right. And there seems to me certain, um, not explicit, but implicit um, uh, mm. relationships in his, his writing and the kind of deadpan, straightforward um, uh, uh, insights of, of Warhol. Yeah. So I wonder if you... Well, I think, I mean, talked about I mean, that. I think any yeah. kind of serious critic, you know, if it's any serious journalist, certainly in a newspaper, you, you know, you, you're very closely tied to and interested in your particular time in history. I mean, what, I mean, the present is what matters to you most. I mean, that's the only reason anyone would work at a newspaper, is what's going on that particular day, what's going on in the culture around you, you know, how you interpret it. And, in, and, and ideally, to kind of nurture the best things you can find in the culture. And, and I think it's interesting because, I mean, I think I'm a very different critic than, than Herbert, but partly because I'm formed by a different mm -hmm. time. And he was writing, he started to write, and it's interesting when he decided to stop because he was writing at a time when a lot of the architects were suddenly building now, weren't building at all. I mean, most of the work they did, they didn't even, weren't even sure whether they'd ever see any of it built. And so he was trying to nurture things that, that existed in the realm of ideas and, and did not exist in the physical world, you know, in the same sort of way. Most of the architecture that was built at that time, um, I think most of us would have considered awful, you know, mm -hmm. in relation to what the, where the real thinking and real, the real energy was in architecture. It wasn't in the same place. It wasn't basically the buildings you saw walking down the street. It was the ideas that you found in people's studios that you weren't sure if they were ever going to exist. And it's interesting because he, he stepped away from his position at a moment when all of a sudden the people that he'd been following for 20, 25 years were putting up buildings, mm -hmm. you know. And I know because we spoke about this a lot, it was very uncomfortable for him in a way how to deal with it. What do you do with Frank Gehry when you spent 20 years trying to get people to pay attention to him, to understand what it is he's trying to do, to understand the underlying ideas, the emotion behind it, and all of a sudden Frank Gehry turns around and he can build as much as he wants. And there's no real reason to try to give him traction anymore. It's almost like all of a sudden your children are all out in the world and you have to kind of let them go. Um, and I think, um, I think part of him at the end was struggling with that, with trying to find a new way to talk about things. And at the very end, um, there was a moment when he was thinking, I mean, until he got sick of, of doing some curatorial work and organizing shows as kind of a different way of approaching things. But I think, um, you know, for me it's strange because I have kind of one foot in that world and one foot in the world now. And I've already found that it just in the last five years, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's been a real effort to try to adjust to the reality that now you're actually looking at these buildings in the world. And you have, to, you have to bring a whole different set of critical tools in terms of trying to understand them. You know, it's not just if they work as ideas, but now they're, they're actually being tested in the world, mm -hmm. those ideas. And you have to start to try to come to terms with, you know, how they fail and how they succeed in a very different way. So, you know, I mean, I think it's just as a Louise was working at a time when there, had, there was no history of criticism when she came along. You know, the preservation movement didn't exist in mm -hmm. the United States, you know. I mean, you're always kind of grappling with the issues that are the most immediate, which is one of the nice things about working with a news, in a newspaper. Yeah. Um, just a really direct question, because uh -huh. I'm really interested in how... Uh, does, the, does the New York Times call you and say, we want you to be our architecture critic? Like, how... Uh. I'm wondering <laughs> how uh, 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 nebulous this... this this process is? Or you mean of being kind of hired? Of yeah, of being hired. Yeah. No, the New York Times doesn't really call anybody. It's, it's, it's a very, uh, is this being taped? It can, be a very, <laughs> it can be a very kind of pompous organization that way. They feel as though like, you know, so someone approaches you and gets a feel for whether you're interested in the job and then they kind of, I mean, it's a, it's, I mean, it's just a silly story. I mean, it's, you know, they, they kind of, it's a, I guess it's the same as with anybody else looking for a job. You know, I spoke to Herbert and I had been actually speaking about it for a long time because he'd been thinking of stepping down mm -hmm. for more than a year. And then, you know, I just flew in and had an interview and snuck up the back stairs so that no one would see me there. And then, you know, one thing led to another. I mean, 
you know, there were there as I said before, there are very few you know full time critics mm -hmm. in the United States, so the talent pool is very limited. They didn't have much, many choices. It's <laughs> oh, <that's> a very <laughs> modest way of putting it. Um, but Musham he ran a a, a, a course on, on architectural criticism, did he not in the 80s, I believe. Yeah, at Parsons, and mm. I don't really know much about that. I mean, he was, you know, I think that he, you know, he put a fair amount of effort into nurturing uh, not only architects, but writers and critics and people who were, you know, uh, you know, d who, you know, who were interested in different parts of the field and things like that. You know, he was certainly very supportive of me. Mm -hmm. You know, which is great. And um, I just wanted to ask a little bit about the, the kind of mechanics of, of how stories um, are generated mm -hmm. um, and whether th how much it, the stories are generated from, y from yourself or from your managing editor. F on, and, uh, and then a little bit about um, uh, you know, how you find freedom within mm -hmm. um, as a critic. Yeah. Um, because in, in a sense, uh, I mentioned in, in the introduction, you know, architecture is something that as a subject has um, maybe only relatively recently garnered mm -hmm. a kind of popular um, uh, um, sort of uh, appreciation. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that you can always measure that by where it is, which page number it is in, in, in the paper. Um, because perhaps, and I, you know, maybe there are many reasons why that, that is maybe that's to do with the obfuscating language that architects sometimes use, uh, or or I don't know what. But um, could you maybe explain to us how that little bit that that process works in terms of story well, I mean, making? in terms of story selection, I mean, th there's a history at least in the United States with critics, and it's a very strong tradition at the Times that editors don't aren't really allowed to meddle with anything a critic does. So there are certain things that, I mean, there is a very strict wall between the critic and the paper. If anyone, or a columnist, for example, at a newspaper. So if you have an opinion about something, they're not supposed to get involved in, uh, or even raise questions about your opinion. So, um, and, and they've been, uh, in, in, at least in my experience, in terms of what I write about and what I choose to write about, um, uh, I've, I mean, there's certain things, let's put it this way, that you have to cover. You know, if mm. MoMA is, if there's a new built, you know, edition of MoMA that's, gonna, that's going to open, whether I like it or not, I have to force myself to go down and look <laughs> at it and write about it. You know, I mean, it, if like, you know, the glass house is reopened, they force me to go up and see that. I mean, but I kind of, you know what those, mm -hmm. those stories are and you force yourself to, you know you're going to do it up front so it doesn't ever become a conversation. The real issue for me is really simple. It's always mm -hmm. about time. It's mm -hmm. about time and balance. And how can you actually cover a, uh, uh, a subject that's so incredibly broad, especially if you're interested in the kind of, you know, the political and social and economic aspects and psychological aspects that shape it, you know, and you're trying to tell a certain story about the subject. How do you do that when you can only churn out a certain number of stories a year, you know? And, and I write probably about 50 stories a year. So you know, there's a certain number of buildings you want to cover, you know, and then there's a certain kinds of subjects. Maybe let's say, in terms of urban planning, that you want to cover. There's a certain number of things you have to cover because they're happening in New York and people want to know about them. There's a certain number of shows you want to review, mm -hmm. you know. And then there's the space after that where you want to actually try to piece things together in a different way and tell a different kind of story. And so the struggle for me is always finding the, the time to actually be able to tell all those different sides of the story. And, um, and get a certain amount of sleep, you know? <laughs> so I think that's, I mean, in terms of the paper, the independence is amazing. I think what's crippling to architecture critics and other papers, and I've been very lucky this way, um, is that um, uh, in terms of, sp of space, the number of words that will allow you to write a story, which is a particular problem in, in daily newspapers, and the amount of money there they're willing to invest in terms of travel and things like that. I mean, I was very lucky that when I was at the LA Times, uh, the paper was doing very well and they were very generous with me. Um, but there's a lot of pressure put on newspapers right now, especially because of the internet and things like that. And because financially they're not doing as well as investors, the kinds of getting the kinds of returns that investors now expect in, you know, 
uh, our, our, you know, intensified capitalist culture. And so there's a lot of pressure to shorten the length of stories. There's a lot of pressure on a lot of friends of mine, for example, critics who are at the LA Times now, travel a lot less than they were able to before, which, um, which is, uh, makes it very difficult to be able to, I mean, you can't write about things you don't see. Mm. So those kinds of pressures are very real. And you know, what happens with the length issue is that you know, what gets cut out is actually the, the paragraph always where you're able to kind of pull back and talk about things in a broader way. And so that's like a constant struggle. And that's been true with the New York Times. I mean, one of the problems with the paper now is that in, in trying to reimagine itself in a media culture that's been changing very radically, Although publicly they tend to deny this, the length of the stories have gotten shorter, you know, which means the nature of the stories changes. You know, the amount of uh, pages in the news well have shrunk. So, um, which I find incredibly ironic at a time when supposedly with the internet you have as much space as you could possibly need. Mm -hmm. And yet newspapers feel this pressure to actually cut back on the length of things. And the excuse is always that the attention span of the audience is shrinking. You know, but I've always thought that's just bullshit. It's really about economics and making money. So you know, there's a whole issue of kind of newspapers and how they're negotiating these things. And over the course of your life as a critic, working in a daily paper, you start to feel these pressures in different ways. You know, that wanted, that sorry. affects you know how you write in a very profound way, and it's very subtle. You know, actually, you just mentioned one of the the A words I want to talk about, which is that of the audience. Mm -hmm. And I wonder, um, you know, because the, the 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 process of writing is, is a, even though you as you've said have a huge amount of freedom mm -hmm. then there must be s um, certain con not constraints but parameters that kind of orbit around what it is you can write about and who it is that you're writing to and is there is there um, through the New York Times is there a kind of uh, an idealized uh, or romanticized even reader to whom uh, New York Times writers are aiming themselves at like you can you, you take for granted certain political affiliations or certain kind of socioeconomic background and so on and so forth how much does that not necessarily figure in your act of writing but it's something mm -hmm. that um, oh, that's outside is a sort pressure. of presence yeah for, no for I mean writing. I think that there's this tr there's a history in newspapers um, of being able to speak to a general audience. And there is this kind of anti-intellectualism that someti sometimes the two kind of come together, that you, you often come across in newspapers. That you, you, on the one hand, there's this pressure, which should be internal too, to make things accessible to a, a general audience. Because what you're really trying to do, it, part of the job I've always felt is to translate, is to make a connection between the world that we live in you know, as architects or academics and critics, and the world that people outside, you know, that the, re the rest of the world, basically, everybody else. And to find a way, I mean, I hate talking about, you know, trying to educate an audience because that can sound so dry, but in a way, you're trying to give people, I think, and maybe sometimes this is the most important thing, the tools to be able to read architecture, you know, which all of us have, and is not something that, you know, that the average person has, because it's a subject that, for whatever historical reasons that we could get into some other time, has been made to feel intimidating, mm -hmm. you know, in the same way medicine has, in the same way art has, and things like that. And so I think part of the struggle is to, is to make a bridge between those two audiences, and I, I think that's really critical to what you do as a critic. In terms of outside pressures, sometimes you have editors who um, in, in mistake the idea of making things accessible um, for uh, a tendency to kind of dumb things down and as I said kind of an anti-intellectualism which I think can be disastrous because you want to try to convey those ideas without turning them into cliches you know and so that's you know that's something that you come across mm -hmm. often in terms of of trying to reach the audience and thinking of who the audience is and things like that but I think generally speaking as I said I've had a great deal of freedom and I think a lot of critics do at papers, so that tends to be more of an internal struggle yeah. than an external struggle. Because mm -hmm. in the end, if you put your foot down, the word usually does stay in, even if the editor doesn't re really know what it means. Uh, so. 
I'd like, maybe in a, in, a, in a little bit we'll talk about certain specific words that yeah. have, <laughs> have, 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 have played a role um, in the last few years in, in, in journalism in America. But there, there's an, um, I'm going to do this horrible thing, which is horrible for writers when you have things quoted back at, right, back at right. them, but I'm going to do it anyway. Uh, so you become <coughs> a, accountable and responsible for the things that you've written. Um, but there's one article that you wrote um, in the last few weeks, which I thought was kind of interesting, which threw up a whole series of... Uh, presumably kind of uh, difficulties but also perhaps a certain amount of enjoyment which is um, uh, where you had to review your new uh, the, the new building for, oh, the, right. for the New York yeah. Times uh, and the piece was called Pride and Nostalgia mix in the in the Times new house and it's a new um, um, uh, skyscraper mm -hmm. a short skyscraper by, by Renzo Piano and right. you moved in Relatively officially in June and in June. It opened in, I don't remember, whenever the story ran, November or something Yeah, like that. that's right. Yeah. And, uh, and at the very beginning, you, uh, you, you get the, uh, the kind of, eth it's kind of ethical uh, dilemma disclaimer out of the way, and, and, and you write, writing about your employer's new building is a tricky task. If I love it, the reader will suspect that I'm currying favor with the man who signs my checks. If I hate it, I'm just flaunting my independence. Right. Um, and uh, uh, I wonder if you could talk about that because it was we were talking about this uh, yesterday. And you said there was a there's a kind of uh, an issue came up, which uh, mm -hmm. comes up, let's say, when New York Times writers have a book that mm -hmm. come out and has to be reviewed, uh, and that sort of uh, that those issues came into play with you re reviewing this uh, your own new building. Yeah, there was a lot of discussion. I mean, I mean. Normally, the Times' policy, and I think this is true of most newspapers, I don't know if it's true here, but if, if, for example, a columnist writes a book, they usually get an outside critic to come in and review it because they don't want a Times critic reviewing the book of a Times author, I mean a Times author. So um, in my case, uh, some of the editors, when the subject ca first came up, um, just assumed that I wouldn't review the building. And I immediately, my reaction was, of course I'm going to review the building. But I was thinking of it from the point of view that it's the only opportunity I'll ever get in my life to review a building that I'm actually going to have to live with for the rest of my you know, career. Rest of your life, anyway, that might be another rest of your life. right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> another three months, maybe whatever. <laughs> but so um, there was this discussion back and forth about um, about whether I should be allowed to review the building. As soon as I said I wanted to do it, they said go ahead and do it. But I felt, um, and I think in terms of these ethical rules. If you're really upfront with your reader from the beginning, I think you can pretty much, you're free to do anything you want, as long as you're clear with them and honest with them about what it is you're doing. And that's why, you know, once I kind of wrote that lead, it's not only a question of just finding an ethical way to write the story, but it just made it much easier to write the rest mm -hmm. of the story because I was really letting myself off the hook yeah. and saying, okay, so this is the situation. We all know what it is, so you can make your own judgments about whether you know, I was biased or unbiased or uh, sucking up to the publisher or whatever, but at least it's all out there. And I think, you know, whether it worked or didn't work, it was a it was a it was a fun exercise for me to actually have to sit down in front of a computer and and uh, and try to think through a building that I knew that I was going to have to work. And the other thing is, I really want to write about it because the building, in a lot of ways, to me, speaks to the intersection between journalism and architecture mm -hmm. and how he interpreted what it is that we do. And in that sense, maybe I looked at it more as a client than I would have in other cases. You know? and, and that's why the nostalgia of it was interesting to me, because it really, the thing that struck me most about that building, which is very Miesian in a lot of ways, was that it was really trying to make a link back to a period when the New York Times was particularly revered and powerful in a way that maybe it isn't really anymore and won't be for much longer, given how tumultuous you know, journalism is, and especially print journalism right now. So it was a way to talk about that, and it was something that I've always wanted to write about in some sense. So, you know, and, and I think that's always kind of why you write these stories. There's something else you want to talk about that you mm -hmm. want to bring in. And so. Renzo Piano is doing rather well in New York, isn't he? But he's building a lot. Yeah. He's the scooper upper. The scooper upper, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. 
Yeah, no, it's true. It's well, that's not just in New York. That's all over the states now. LA, he's the kind of fallback. He's the fallback guy. Yeah, or sometimes doesn't even scoop up. But I mean, in Rem's case, you know, Rem will kind of get the commission, design a building, and then they brush him out the back door, and Renzo comes in and takes care of it all. <laughs> And I don't know if that's because he's a less threatening architect than some others. I think it's because he's quite cuddly. Yeah. yeah. Well, he's... Adorable. He's adorable. Yeah, he's very easy to get along with. Yeah. Although... Cuddly, yeah. yeah. And, and I guess there's something safe about his work, too, and unthreatening about his work. And at the same time, it is elegant. You know, it's a certain kind of progressive language that makes people feel comfortable at the same time as though they're actually moving forward, you know. Show anyone. Yeah, no. Although he can be kind of off color in private, but I don't know if he is with clients. <laughs> um, I, reading another one of your, your pieces, I realized that uh, the, 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 the New York Times has uh, shrunk uh, in size. You said that, uh, well, on the general point about journalism, you said journalism too has moved on reality TV, um, anonymous bloggers, the threat of ideologically driven global media enterprises. Such forces have undermined newspapers' traditional mission. The New York Times page width was reduced in August, mm -hmm. um, which is uh, a very direct uh, knock-on effect of the decline in, in adver advertising. Is, is, is that right? Well, that's not the argument that they make. I mean, there's no question that the paper financially hasn't been as healthy in the last you know, few years as it, as, it, as, it, as it has been. But um, I think, you know, the argument in newspapers, in, in most newspapers that have a history like the Times or the LA Times or the Chicago Tribune has been that the big threat is the internet and how do you get people to read the paper on the web and all of that. And for me, um, uh, I think that that has been a mistake because the real issue is that if you look at the most kind of successful media formulas now. It's about reaching your audience in as many ways as possible. There's a different way that people accumulate information now. And I think that, that uh, it's, um, if you look at, when we were talking about this yesterday, we were talking about Murdoch, who's, um, you know, just bought the Wall Street Journal. I don't know if people here follow kind of what happens at newspapers lately. But, you know, it's someone who came from kind of tabloid journalism and has managed to take control of some very serious newspapers in London and in New York. He, um, you know, he owns TV stations. There's all kinds of things that he has access to an audience in all sorts of different ways. And a detail that I thought was really interesting was that when he, one of the conversations he apparently had before he even bought the paper was that maybe they should change the name from the Wall Street Journal to the Journal because the Wall Street Journal was too provincial. And it's a conversation you could never have inside the walls of the New York Times. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm, sh there's, I'm sure there's never been a board member who's ever said, let's cut the New York out of the New York Times because we're living in a global world. Mm -hmm. So you see, I mean, these kinds of shifts are really interesting because you can see, I mean, the image we were talking about that I don't know if you need to show, but you see these three towers. Um, uh, Murdoch was part of this package to build this huge development on the west side of Manhattan. And, then, and, and there's an image that they released um, as part of the proposal where you see the Hearst Tower that was designed by Foster in the skyline, which is kind of teeny. It's a stunted kind of 20-story tower, which was kind of the great news, the most powerful newspaper in New York, chain in New York in the 1920s. And in the middle of the image is the New York Times building, which is Renzo's, which is very dignified and a little bit bigger. And then you see um, to the right of the image this uh, gargantuan tower that's the size of of like the Empire State Building and twice as thick, which is Murdoch's tower. And you can see kind of, you can read through the architecture, the whole history of the development of, of journalism in New York and the kind of shift of power over decades. And you know, you know, one of the things that's interesting to me is how hard it is for an institution like the Times to understand that things can change that quickly. That actually, even in, a, let's say, um, an 80-year history as a newspaper, um, I mean, the, the paper is older, but where the newspaper has been very, very influential um, in American culture, American politics, and the rest of it, that that's actually a very short time, and it can end very quickly. Um, you know, if you're not quick on your feet, and if you're not really aware of what's going on in the world around you. 
or, or able to kind of be flexible enough to adjust to it. And so it's something that you, know, you hear about all the time inside the newspaper is the anxiety of wondering if you know, we're reacting quickly enough and if people, re people don't really feel as though they know what's happening in the future. You know? and it's, it's, it's really strange to watch because you feel as though you're part of this tradition at the same time you may be at the very tail end of it. Mm -hmm. you know? well, presumably the, the, the New York Times uh, website plays a huge part in, in, in reimagining its identity and, and being more forward looking. I mean, oh, one yeah. of the things no, I know. An enormous amount of yeah. investment's gone on on the website mm -hmm. and developing it and um, all kinds of, being, bringing all kinds of gimmicks into it. I mean, one of the things, but I do think that, that still the idea of focusing entirely on the website is, an, is a fairly narrow way of thinking about how information gets communicated in the world now. You know, and um, I mean, I think even the, you know, the other thing about Murdoch that's so interesting is that, you know, the, the, the American model of journalism as this kind of, uh, the kind of pursuit of objective truth um, and that it's written from a neutral point of view is a model that Murdoch, for example, has no interest in at all, you know. And is also very, it's a, it's a very short time period even in American, uh, uh, in the history of American journalism. So, you know, these things are always in a state of shift. You know, they're always evolving, they're always changing. And I think it's interesting to be in a place where that sense of tradition is so strong that it's assumed that it's going to just live forever, mm -hmm. you know. And I don't think that it's actually that clear or ever is that clear, you know. The editor of uh, The Independent here, I think, a few weeks said um, that... Uh, It'll, the onus on newspapers will be because because information is uh, mm -hmm. is everywhere, as it were. Mm -hmm. Facts are kind of <coughs> or purported facts, mm -hmm. let's say, are, are easy to download, easy to get hold of. That increasingly, um, the inimitable the inimitable function of a newspaper will be to provide the yeah, opinions. You mm -hmm. know, and well, I like um, that idea. And do you, is, would you agree with Would you agree with with that? No, I don't agree with that because I think there are things that you can do. I mean, I think what worries me, for example, about um, the idea of, of, of tightening the length of stories, you know, is that there's certain things that a paper like the Times can do that you could never do. Most people just don't have the resources to do it, you know. I mean, if you look at the war in Iraq, for example, well, maybe that's not the greatest example, but I mean, you, you, the amount of people you have on the ground yeah. working in that bureau, the experience they have, the amount you can vet, invest in terms of research, all of that is something that, it t it's an enormous investment, you know, and it's not something that you can do by sitting in your apartment and, and just gabbing on, you know, writing a blog. You know, you're not actually seeing things. Even in terms of architecture criticism, I mean, the most important thing I do, basically, is that I get on a plane when I want to write about a building and I actually have the freedom to go look at it and spend two days walking through it and I'll actually pay for that. And when I come down and s whether I'm right or wrong or it's an intelligent piece or not, you know, when I sit down to write about it, I've actually seen it as architecture. You know, and I think that's really, really, really important. It's increasingly important now. We have so much noise in the world and so much of it is, is really uninformed. And I think that's a, a really big part of what's important about the paper. And uh, I had a conversation with the former e e executive editor of the New York Times not that long ago, we were talking about the building, we were talking about what's happening in journalism, and he said, well, we were talking about the shrinking of the news hole and the shorter stories and things like that, and he said, well, his attitude was that, you know, if it turns out that this kind of journalism is going to die out, if there was ever an institution in the United States that should go down with its guns blazing, it's the New York Times, mm -hmm. that we shouldn't be trying to adapt in terms of you know, shortening and tightening the stories and doing things that are more superficial. We should be actually writing longer stories, more in depth, with the kind of research and the kind of investment and resources and the eyes on the ground that few other institutions have the resources to do or the interest in doing anymore. So I don't think that the idea that newspapers will be reduced to commenting on things is a healthy way of thinking about it. Mm -hmm. And I don't think it's actually the it's one, obviously I think it's one of the important things that newspapers do, but I don't think it's necessarily the most important things they do at this given moment. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's actually, you know, it's everything that goes on behind the story, you know, and I think that's very, very, very important, and I think one of the problems with, uh, you know, 
what you see on the web and the kind of the, 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 the endless noise is how ill-informed it is and how anybody, no matter how ignorant, I mean, it's great, it's very democratic, but at the same time, there are, you know, there are such a thing as standards, you know. You mentioned uh, the I word, Iraq. Right, <laughs> and yeah. I'm wondering whether um, uh, it's been, in retrospect now, because we can't even say <laughs> retrospect, having mm -hmm. s celebrating, celebrating, happy birthday, yeah. the fifth anniversary of the invasion of Iraq. Um, <coughs> has it been a good or bad, how has it affected the culture of, of, of journalism over the last five years? As, and generally speaking, but also for you as an architecture critic. And, uh, and I, just, I, I just append that with, with the idea that, I mean, one of the things of 9-11 was that, um, it, obviously, it was a, a symbol of, arch uh, well, mm -hmm. literally speaking, it was a, a piece of architecture that was attacked, mm -hmm. um, which suddenly brought attention to architecture in a wholly different way. Yeah. And then the ensuing melodrama, uh, endless saga of what's going to happen in, uh, on Ground Zero, yeah. which must have, is presumably and rightfully one of the uh, uh, um, stories that the New York Times must, for probably from a myriad number of ways, yeah. keep up with, um, comment on, analyze, digest, and so on and so forth. Um, yeah. Well, I think in terms of what I do, September 11th, um, was more important than the war in Iraq in the sense that, you know, it, the unfolding of that story really teaches you something about what's happened to architecture in terms of what the expectations are and, and, um, and what the expectations aren't. And I think also, um, I mean, I don't know, there's so many different kind of ways we could talk about this. I mean, the Ground Zero story, in, I think, uh, even in terms of what you are allowed to say and the things that you aren't allowed to say um, was very revealing to me. I, there's a couple, a friend of mine who's an art critic in LA <laughs> and I um, uh, went through a series of stories we were writing on, on the heels of Ground Zero where you started to feel this kind of tightening of restrictions in terms of, it's the first time I'd ever felt that, in terms of words you could use and you could not use in a story. And one of the issues, one of the big issues for me has always been that um, as much as I'm interested in architecture, I'm always trying to put it in some kind of context, it's political, social, economic, in terms of the kind of forces that actually shape, you know, shape these buildings, not as something that's just shaped exclusively by the architect. And when in, uh, immediately following September 11th, there was this unease with the idea that you should be talking about ar as architecture as anything but architecture in a more classical sense, let's say the way A. Louise Huxville wrote about it, you know, 40 years ago, is that you should focus on the buildings. And I know that, um, I mean, there was a story I wrote a couple of weeks after September 11th um, where I referred to the U.S. Um, I can't remember what the line was, but I used the word imperialist and the copy editor took the word out, and then I put it back in, and then I took it, and then she took it out again, and then we had a screaming fight, and then it went to the managing editor, and the managing editor sent it to the editor of the paper, and they took it out, and then I was told not to make a big fuss out of it. And two weeks later, the art critic wrote a story and referred to, I can't remember if he said this, idiotic war. Um, no, I'm sorry, this was after the invasion, actually, so it must have been months later, but anyway, and they had him, he was reprimanded for using the word. And those kind of, that kind of tightening in terms of the subject and, and what you were allowed to talk about, start, you could feel it start to loosen up maybe six months later, a year after that. And, and this was all at the LA Times, but I've heard similar stories in other papers. And, and I found that really revealing in terms of what, how your subject ends up being defined by your editors, and that's something that I, I mean, we talked about this before, and I said in a way that they never meddle with things. But that was the one time where I started to feel a sense of what the limits are or aren't mm -hmm. in terms of what you can discuss. I mean, I've been lucky that, um, I mean, since I've come to, well, even at the LA Times, I went to Baghdad to write a series about the city right after, the, a couple of months after, uh, you know, the United States invaded the country. Um, and 
um, you know, since then for the New York Times, I've written about uh, the wall in the West Bank um, um, and subjects that uh, I've done a lot of stories in New Orleans, for example, subjects where you can't really talk about it without talking about the politics of it. And they've always been very comfortable with it. If they haven't been comfortable with it, they haven't said anything about it. But you do feel as though you're kind of pressing against this kind of envelope. You know, and there's a moment where you cross a line and suddenly people start to tell you what it is that your responsibilities are and limits are as a critic. You know? And I think that that's the way that, in terms of what I do, things like September 11th and the war in Iraq, where you start to see how it affects the way people cover things. I mean, in terms of journalism in general, there's, we could talk about it endlessly. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think, if anything, it's made it clear how, uh, how little courage there is in journalism now in terms of um, aggressively going after stories and really kind of digging under the surface of things, um, which is incredibly you know, depressing. But, um, but that's you know, sure. a different story. Uh, uh, another thing quickly I'd like to ask you about is uh, 2008, uh, it's one all to Hillary and Obama. Right. And uh, obviously in America, it, presidential years are just unbelievable uh, mm -hmm. things for the media. And uh, I mean, last night when the, the, the votes were being counted, I went onto the New York Times website and mm -hmm. just the number of opinions, the number of kind of people writing and the live blog and the live commentary, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. I wonder how, it, does it, will it, uh, this year, will this be your first presidential year or did you have one in 2004 when, you, was that right? Where, Meaning uh, in my when, life or? No, 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 in, at, at, the times, at the times, at the times, yeah. And I'm just wondering uh, if, if it ha had an effect or will have an effect at all as an architecture critic, whether that frenzy and that kind of uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, the various, whether it seeps into every little bit of the paper or whether you have very clear fiefdoms within... Um, uh, no, I mean, there's definitely, I mean, there's, there's, there's certain ways, I mean, one of the great things about a newspaper is that you're in this kind of like atmosphere mm -hmm. where you're always involved, you're always interested and you're always having conversations about what's, what's going on at that moment in terms of the political atmosphere. And, and so, you know, I think some critics maybe focus for, it, 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 I don't want to say narrow, but anyway, focus on their, in a kind of more closed way on their subject, and I try not to. I mean, one of the things I find interesting, I was talking to someone about this earlier today, um, about the Obama-Clinton things. I think there is a parallel in architecture, which is that the kind of oppositional politics that has defined, mm. you know, America in a lot of ways since, let's say, Vietnam and before, but certainly since the civil rights movement. There's a parallel in that, in architecture, in the kind of, the, the, the kind of, this idea that there's this kind of modernist history that you can follow and then there's this kind of reactionary postmodernist history that was so strong in the United States for the last 20 years and, and there's it's still very kind of stubbornly you know fighting for some space in the culture it's still very much a part of 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 uh, it's a debate that's still very much alive even if it, a lot of the rest of the world has actually moved on you know and I think that there's one of the things that's happening now is an effort to try to break away from that idea that there's always this kind of like these two sides to the debate, mm. you know, and they're always in op opposition to each other. That actually, they're, for the first time, I think, ever in architecture, you have a lot of different competing points of view that can actually coexist. And I think for a younger generation, there's a sense that they should coexist, you know, and that there actually is room for all of them, you know, and I think that's a very important shift in terms of what's happening to architecture now. And I think what's funny to me is that the relationship, the, 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 you can put Edwards and, and Clinton on one side of that divide and you can put Obama on the other side of it. And, it. and you can see how it's actually the same kind of split and the effort to break away from that is happening in the political culture now. So it's really part of a much larger, hopefully, cultural shift in the country. Um, and obviously, you know, you have to fit mm -hmm. George Bush and all of that and, uh, into that too, I mean. But it's that sense of kind of on the one hand, on the other hand, that the two sides, you know, where there's no room in between, that he's obviously trying to break that down. And I think you can actually see the same thing happening in architecture. There are certain people trying to, 
break that down, and I think it will get broken down as a kind of new generation moves into the profession who doesn't see things that to, way. I'm trying to figure out who, who is, who's, who's Clinton and who's Obama in yeah. the architecture world. Well, I, th I think there are a lot of Clintons out there <laughs> still. <laughs> We're waiting for our yeah, we're Obama. Yeah, we're waiting for the Obamas, for Obama. yeah. Um, and uh, maybe the last question before we open up to the floor, which is about um, the, uh, uh, just frankly, your, your opinion on, on the state of, uh, of, of, of things in, in New York in the, over the last few years. You wrote a piece uh, uh, just before Christmas called Manhattan's Year of Building Furiously. Mm -hmm. And uh, you said that, uh, that for af af after many years of being uh, uh, a critic that had no other choice than mm -hmm. bemoan the, the relentless amount of crap that was going up, yeah. that in 2007 maybe things, to use your uh, phrase, may have finally turned a corner. Mm -hmm. um, and um, uh, and uh, you've, you mentioned three, uh, three different uh, kind of categories of things. So one was major new landmarks, two was outright gems, uh, mm -hmm. things like Gary's, Beerman, uh, mm -hmm. building Nouvelle's new uh, luxury residences, mm -hmm. and then the third was architecture exhibitions. Mm -hmm. um, could you say a little bit more about this, the turning of this corner in, in 2007? Well, it's weird for me because, the, you know, it's, again, it's about this shift that's going on in terms of, of uh, you start rethinking how you cover things because on, on the one hand, you know, 10, even five years ago, it was, in, it was infuriating to look at the kind of work that was still going up in, in New York, especially as other cities in the world would start to embrace a much more, um, much more interesting forms of architecture, you know. And New York seemed so, it's unbelievable. I mean, I learned this working in LA, how incredibly parochial New York is. I mean, there's nothing outside of New York that they're interested in at all on, on some level, you know. And you're starting to see a lot more interesting work going on in the city. But at the same time, the sphere in which architects, or talented architects anywhere, are, are allowed to operate is also incredibly narrow, and this comes back to these other issues, because of the economic realities of the global city and, the, and, and their um, particularly intense in New York, so that almost all of the work is either for corporate headquarters or um, mostly almost every major architect in the world now is doing some kind of you know, luxury residential tower in the city. There's no sense of anything interesting going on in terms of the public realm because there's no government to support it, right? And there's no pressure to actually create that kind of world. So on the one hand, you have very interesting people finally working there. On the other hand, what they're allowed to do is incredibly narrow. You know, so I mean, since I tend to be a skeptic, you know, I see it as something that's like a step forward, but in some ways, two steps back. I mean, because it's it's it's, and this is something we can't really get into now, but it's indicative of the way New York, in particular, and certain cities, traditional cities in general, I think, are starting to turn into a kind of a different. Uh, a completely different kind of organism. And, and in America, that has to do with, you know, it goes back to um, white flight from the inner city during civil rights and during the 1960s, and then the return of people who fled to the city in the last 10, 15 years, mm -hmm. and the values, the suburban values that they brought back with them. And so what they've done is they've turned what was once, you know, this idea of this kind of very lively mixing chamber of ideas and classes and different ethnic groups into something that's actually much closer in a way to the kind of suburban communities that they fled to in the first place. And I think that's really one of the most important things that's going on in New York right now and one of the most frightening things that's going on. And a lot of it just has to do with capital more than anything else. You know, and flows of capital between cities, the amount of money that's flown into that, you know, flooded into that city in the last 10 years. And presumably yeah. also the, the, the broadening of, 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 cli of clients for well, you get, flagship Well, you get a lot, right, you have a lot of clients who are now interested in, in at least famous architects. And those same clients, in terms of the pool of clients, tend to all be the same kind of person. So in terms of, that, in that sense, what you're allowed to do ends up being very narrow. Everyone's getting commissions, and everyone's making money, mm. and everybody's getting recognized now. You know, even if you're maybe less than a 
an important talent. But at the same time, what you're actually allowed to do and the issues you're starting to deal with. And it's interesting to me also, it's, it's worrisome in terms of the next generation that's coming up because you wonder how much energy will go into the kinds of things um, that an earlier generation was obsessed with. Because in terms of their opportunities, they see a lot of work available to them. But at the same time, the kind of areas they're allowed to experiment in are limited. You know, and there's something that's parallel to that, which is that the, you know, the generation we were talking about that Herbert covered, mm -hmm. and that I'm covering now, but in a different way, um, spent 20 years thinking about mm -hmm. things and, and, and proposing things and drawing things and never building them. And in some sense, that gave them a great deal of freedom because it was kind of like, well, fuck the client. There's no client out there. Now, all of a sudden, there are lots of clients out there, and they want very specific things. So I think you go into it with a very different mindset because you're trying to get a hold of that client. And so, you know, I mean, I don't mean to be kind of like a skeptic or a cynic, but I think there's, there's a lot of positive things going on, and underneath the surface, a lot of things that are going on that are very frightening, you know, on some level. I, I think fear is a good, good yeah. point <laughs> to end this part of the conversation. So first, can we uh, please give a round of applause to Nikolai. Yeah. Um, is this, yeah, this is it. Um, we've got maybe ten, ten minutes or so, to, if there are any questions or, or just even comments from, from the floor. Okay. Hi, Nikolai. Uh, I was just wondering what your relationship is with the news desk at the... Um, uh, the New York Times, to what degree, I mean, we were t talking earlier about there being kind of horror stories about architecture. That tends to come from a news desk perspective rather than from a, a critical perspective. And I was just wondering whether they ever called on you for your expertise in an for an architectural story or a story about a building, or whether you ever approached them and gave them an idea for uh, a news story further up the paper. pissed off about some of the stuff I've written down there and he'll and he'll kind of gently point things out that he disagrees with so sometimes you get those emails going back and forth but uh, I think part of it is territorial I mean anyone in here who's a you know works at a newspaper knows that what that's like that I'll kind of fly in write about something and fly out um, but in particular when I've written about um, I've done several stories about um, public housing in New Orleans, which is being bulldozed. Um, there's, I think, 4,000 units of public housing that are bulldozing. And um, given 
the scale of the destruction in that city, the idea that they would bulldoze anything is horrifying to me, but this particular public housing, which dates to the New Deal, um, is, is very, very solid as architecture. And so it was a chance to look at one of the reasons why it failed. And, and what's interesting is one of the cliches about public housing is that it fails because of the architecture and the planning. And in this case, it was very clear to me that the architecture and the planning had nothing to do with its failure. It had to do with the lack of government support for the people who were living in it. So, um, and he didn't agree with that. So basically, that's what the discussion was about. Going to stand up because I. Mm -hmm. um, I just wanted to ask how loyal you are to architects because one of the things I suppose about. Yeah, when you're when you're kind of involved with architects and you're friendly with them and you've studied architecture. Right. Um, you you obviously kind of you end up feeling kind of quite loyal to them, especially to, to kind of design architects or avant-garde architects who are struggling um, against the, the system. But on the other hand, if you're a critic, you've got to be prepared. To Mm -hmm. And it was incredibly controversial, and Daniel Liston wrote, got his whole office to write in and a demand that well, I think Liston sent an email to kind of everybody he knew asking them to write into the editor of the New York Times to ask him to sack um, Herbert. Right. And there was this huge controversy, and, and I mean, it was, it was a very kind of, it was a very brave article to write for him because here you had, you know, Liston, who's, you know, somebody who struggled to get anything built for years, and here, here he was doing this controversial scheme. In a, Mm -hmm. um, but I, I, I think that's, you know, the impression I've got of him is something that places a, an architect critic all, all the time. And I wonder how you get around that. Well, I mean, I think you try to keep in mind, I mean, that your, your job is to be an advocate for architecture, not for architects, you know, and what you're looking at really in the end is the work. But having said that, I think there's something about the history of architecture criticism that is different than a lot of other critics because, I mean, a film critic, you go, you sit down, you see the movie, and you leave, and you write about it, and you have very little contact with the director or the people who make the film. As an architecture critic, a lot of the stories you're writing about builders, buildings that aren't done yet, right? So you spend a lot of time in the offices of the architects looking over plans, looking at models, and also um, trying to report on you know, the different things, that the client's opinions, the things that actually shape the building. So if you're getting into that territory, you tend to have a much more direct relationship with the subject than you often would in, um, than another critic might. So, I mean, I think, I think that does kind of create a situation that can be very touchy sometimes. But, um, you know, a long time ago, a, a friend of mine who, who's, who's a critic, uh, we were talking about this when I was still a baby critic, and and he said we were talking about kind of when do you know when do you how do you decide where you cross that line, or where you haven't crossed that line? And he said, well, it's pretty simple. As soon as you sit down to write a story, and you feel that twinge of anxiety that you're going to offend someone, you know you can't write about them anymore. And so I think you know you know in a way for yourself, you know when you're when you've kind of crossed the line that you you can't pull back from anymore, you know? And I think those are, I mean, those are the kinds of things you struggle with, but I mean, those are the, I think that's really what it comes down to in a way, it's as simple as that. Eddie, can someone else say something? Yeah. Mm -hmm, sure. I, I, I forget the mic, it's not that, it's all right. It's not that big a room, but that, um, I want to ask you something about power. Mm -hmm. Because you mentioned that the New York's quite broken. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it interests me that the, the critics in New York, the theater critic, the film critic, the designer, the thinker, had incredible power. Yeah. We may have six or six critics or whatever it is we have in London, but none of us had any kind of power like yeah. we have at the Times. And, and I wonder why that was. I mean, a critic in New York can shut a show, you know, yeah. without a doubt, in, in two nights, it can go dark in the theater. Mm -hmm. Here, there's no one with that. There's no one individual with that power. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Well, it's, it's, I mean, it's interesting because, I mean, one of the things that, you know, when this, this came up a lot for the first time when I was in L.A. because the L.A. Times is the only paper in Los Angeles, and it has been the most powerful. It was the, it's been the only paper for decades, but it was the most powerful paper for over, I mean, most people here will be shocked to know L.A. is more than 10 years old, but for, you know, a hundred, more than a hundred years, you know. Um, and it has a very strange history because the family that owned it was so politically powerful in the city. But I think really what it has to do with it was the only paper there, you know? And, and so what happens is the critic's voice takes on this incredible authority because people start to think that you're speaking as this kind of omnipotent being, you know? And I think that's actually incredibly <coughs> unhealthy. And I found, I, I found myself, I've gotten more comfortable with it over the years. But initially, I was very uncomfortable with the idea that you weren't actually having just an opinion, that people read it as though it was the opinion of authority. And it's even more true at the New York Times than it was at the LA Times for obvious reasons, because of its reach and because it's such a, you know, it's, it's an incredible platform in that sense. But I don't think it's an incredibly healthy thing. What I think is healthy is that they've always played architecture and culture up a lot. So you get a lot of space. You know, if they think it's an important story, they play it on the front page in culture, you get a lot of, you know, you, you get, you get, they give the story a lot of attention. And I obviously think that that's always important in terms of culture, in terms of architecture. What I think is maybe not so healthy is the, f I think in some sense it's, it's healthier here that you have six or seven different voices and different opinions about any one story. And it affects the way the reader approaches the story because they know going in you're just one voice. So, you know, I mean, obviously, I don't always agree with the other, the few, you know, the other, the other critics that are around in the states. But it would be nice to have more of a sense that there were, there was a kind of, there were other platforms out there, so that you were have, you were part of a discussion as opposed to just kind of like yeah. this judge, you know, <laughs> slamming his gavel down on on a project. And do you feel the pressure? So, I mean, if you are the one opinion, that's quite an onus on you to. It's a kind of responsibility. Well, I definitely have felt often, you write a story, and I've definitely gotten into bed at night feeling nervous that if you get it wrong, you're doing damage to someone, you know, or a project or someone's career in a way that, I mean, yeah, I mean, I definitely feel a, often a lot of anxiety about it, you know. Um, I think I feel more anxiety, well, I mean, it's, it, it you know, it, it it depends, you know, when you feel it and when you don't. There's certain projects I feel so strongly about, I think they're so, you know, damaging to the culture that I wish I had a lot more power, you know, because you can't really, in the end, you know, part of that power is a bit of an illusion. I mean, it seems that way, but if, you know, the economic forces are all moving in one direction, there's not much you can do about it. You know, you've got a big platform and you can scream and pound your fists on the floor, but nothing really changes. But yeah, I mean, especially when you're talking about, uh, I've always felt as though there's this kind of split in my mind between dealing with a younger architect who's not established, for example, um, and an architect who really is established in terms of, of maybe being more nurturing and gentle with people as they're trying to find their voice. Um, but that may be something you would feel here too, right? I mean. Yeah. Actually, could I just ask, uh, for those of you who don't know, it's um, Edwin Heathcote, who's the architecture critic at the FT. And I wonder whether y you might be able to tell us, uh, I asked uh, Nikolai earlier about just the, the sort of history of the architecture critic in the, in the yeah. States, in, 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 in the newspaper world. And um, you, how does it compare to, to our, the history of the, the architecture critic here in the papers? And how far back does your position go at the FT, for example? And which was the first broadsheet to have one here? Yeah, do you, do you know? It's, uh, it's a long history in the States, surprisingly, than it is here. Um, really? Well, 
interesting eccentric figures. Yeah. That's interesting. And then it diversified quick. They all took, with the, I think with the boom in the 80s, the form of Asia took, suddenly kind of took, took it seriously. Mm. And it took it further along. But it's, uh, it's an amazing superficial history. <laughs> yeah, it is. <laughs> Everywhere. Yeah. 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 I actually find the Not even there. important differences between the Soviet Union and the American Union is the image and very healthy disrespect for anything that's written in history. Yeah. Yeah. People are much more skeptical, skeptical about what they read. Yes. Yeah. You always see different papers have different biases. Everybody knows that. Yeah. Well, people have gotten more skeptical in the United States about papers. Yeah. Um, but the strange thing is, instead of creating a landscape where you have m many more voices, the skepticism has been basically created by the right you know, as a way of undermining the tradition of journalism, investigative journalism in, in the country. So it's a, it comes from a completely different place. You know, it comes from Fox News, basically. It comes from Murdoch. So it's, you know, it comes from, yeah. I mean, it's a, diff it's a different thing. So it's not a healthy skepticism, the skepticism that we have. It's not the same thing that you're talking about. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's all a liberal conspiracy. Right, exactly. Uh, Justin? Yeah, it's a slightly silly question actually, and it's um, it's for simple turning into a very narrow confine of architectural criticism. Mm -hmm. But um, and it follows on from Edmund's question about power. Mm -hmm. As the architectural critic of the New York Times, you're you have power, but you're also in some sense the establishment. Right. And if we look back, I mean there was a time in your brief chapter called Bilbo, there was rise of I think it was the eighties. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, I haven't. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. No, I don't. I haven't been there long enough to have a nemesis yet. I don't think, or that kind of nemesis. And luckily, I'm I've known Michael for a long time, so I I, I, I keep you know keep your enemies as close as you can. But I mean, I think. What's interesting about that is that, and I do think this actually has to do with Herbert, is that, and it comes back to this idea of, you know, this kind of oppositional politics thing where there's an establishment and anti-establishment, which I think is a very dated idea. I think Paul, um, uh, first of all, saw himself as the establishment and had no interest in changing things from the inside. I mean, he really, you know, uh, he enjoyed his power you know, and I think he saw himself as the voice of the party. And I think, you know, to come back to Herbert, rather than speaking about myself, I think one of the things that Herbert did in being so subjective in his criticism is he kind of, in a way, turned it inside out. You couldn't really look at him and say, this is the voice of authority. Most of the people, the paper were shocked about what he was writing, didn't understand it, were confused by it, and felt like there was something like, is this good, is this bad, I don't know how to deal with this. And I think that sh helped shift the rules, and I don't think that's something that's particular to an architecture critic, but I do think it's, tr it's much harder now to say that, you know, um, that, uh, you know, that the Times critic is the, the voice of authority and the people outside of it are kind of nipping at its heels in the same sort of way. I mean, I certainly try very hard, which is why I wrote a review of our own building, to, to think of myself as someone who has a platform at the paper, but at the same time is independent of it, you know? And I just don't know how long I'll have that platform. It's a privilege and it's great, but I try to kind of, you know, re-examine my relationship to the paper over and over again as I'm writing, you know? Um, in fact, Ram said something to me once uh, that was very funny because when I first started with the job and I was talking, we were talking about the same thing and he said, and I said, you know, one of the things I liked was a lot of my stories were appearing in, in the International Herald Tribune. And he said, maybe you should think of yourself as the New York correspondent of the International Herald Tribune rather than the, the New York Times critic, you know, who appears occasionally in the, New York, in, the, in the Herald Tribune. And he said, maybe you should leave and work for the Herald Tribune. It'll 
make sure your stories appear in the New York Times. And it was all about trying to figure out how you get independence inside this institution. But um, I think that's a condition that's very different now than it was when, when you know, Michael was attacking Paul, you know, because it really was, you know, because Paul saw himself as someone very different. It's an interesting. Oh, you think so? Yeah. Yeah, no, there is the whole blogging phenomenon, which is very kind of, can be kind of, uh, especially now they're a little less anonymous than they used to be, but, you know, there is this kind of, you know, especially in the early days of blogs, there was the kind of, the shield of anonymity that made people particularly spiteful um, and malicious. Um, I don't, you know, I don't think I've been, gotten the brunt of that, but I know a lot of, of critics who have, and uh, that I think is actually, you know, it's one of those things that's um, hopefully will work its way out over time as kind of the, the, a kind of a, uh, a civil culture develops, you know, around the way people use it and things like that. But it's something that I think has been very destructive to architects, actually, um, probably more than to critics. You know, there's this sense that now that a lot of these people have made it, that you have to tear them down. You know, and this generally comes from people who don't understand how much time went into, you know, getting there. These are not people who just appeared overnight. So, I don't know. It's a strange world right now. Any more questions? Um, um, yeah, I just wanted to ask, like, just a more general question before then we can sort of speak to the um, you know, American press and the, and the British press. Mm -hmm. Well, I think the biggest difference is the kind of, um, yeah, the number of papers you have here and how few papers there are, as, you know, as we were saying before, in the United States. Um, I mean, I think there is this tradition, you know, that really the Times was at the center of developing, um, of objective journalism that's particularly American, that you don't see in Italian papers, French papers, and s you see it slightly less here, too, that, um, that's something that, I mean, that's a, a kind of a bigger, disc broader discussion, but in terms of this particularly American and that, that frames kind of the discussion in a different sort of way. And that tradition, what's interesting to me is that it's really not that very old. I mean, you used to have a lot of broadsheets in New York in the 20s and even 30s with very strong political positions. And, I mean, it's a detail, but I guess for me it's kind of an interesting one when, the, when, when uh, uh, the publisher, Arthur Ox of the New York Times, decided that he wanted to make the paper uh, more neutral politically. It was not out of some kind of incredibly altruistic or idealistic idea. It was because he realized he could get more advertising if he didn't have strong political opinions in the paper. And then over time it evolved into something that was considered, you know, you know at the, the foundation for something that I think was very important in American journalism. But it is kind of funny that it came out of something that had to do with money. So that's always an issue in newspapers, advertising, you know, making a profit and things like that. Yeah, I mean, I think that it's very, very hard. It has been for a very long time to be a young architect in the States, and particularly in New York, just because it's a very expensive city. You don't have any kind of competition framework the way you do, I mean, especially in Holland or France or Germany. Um, so there's no real way out. So you end up being put in a situation where um, you're either designing lofts, you know, or you're not doing really anything, or you're trying to enter competitions in Spain or something, hoping that you get your big break. Um, 
You know, there's a very different tradition in the States anyway in terms of how architects build up a career. One of the reasons a lot of people moved west was because land was cheap and there was a lot of it. And so, you know, I mean, I think that's one of the reasons, you know, Gary had so much success over the course of his career. You know, he, it was, a lot of it was, he was just building houses, which is not the way a lot, a lot of his counterparts in Europe built up their careers. But at least there were a lot of them. He could play with a lot of things and there was a sense of freedom in a city like Los Angeles that you probably could never get in Europe in some sense because if you could find the right clients, the range of possibilities seems almost endless. So I mean I think there's a big difference between how people develop as architects in the States and how they develop here and one of the things that's tough now in the States is that uh, the career that he had in Los Angeles is much more difficult to have now than it was then um, for economic reasons for code reasons, because you can't build the kind of flimsy buildings that he was doing back then, which is actually a pro problem. You know, I don't think it's necessarily a good thing, although it's probably good if you have an earthquake. But it's not good in terms of the freedom you have. So I think it's very tough. I find it very hard to find young architects in New York in particular who are doing interesting work. And I tend to, I know a lot of architects who started out with a lot of promise, who've been sitting in their offices for 10 years, you know, which is just a horrible thing to watch. The reverse of that is that I think you see a lot of architects now, which I don't think, ha I know didn't happen a generation ago um, in Europe, some of them in London, who get a very big project very early on, win a competition, and then suddenly get flooded with commissions and don't actually have the chance to really develop their voice and their ideas fully. And so they're suddenly doing, do they have 10, 15 commissions and the work gets very thin very quickly. And that's something I think is very dangerous too that's very new, that's kind of also hard to watch. It's a very tricky, you know, it's a really tricky profession when you're young. To kind of find the space to actually develop your ideas and stay alive, you know. I don't want to end on that note though, but. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, there was on my laptop though. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, it's a wholly image free evening. Right. Um, <laughs> um, maybe I to, I'm going to ask the last question, which mm. is uh, one catchphrase that so seems to have migrated um, uh, in, a, in a delirious manner to the popular, to popular magazines and to, is uh, a word that uh, arouses both disgust and mirth. Mm -hmm. The star architect, mm -hmm. and um, uh, and it's kind of interesting to see it being uttered by uh, you know daytime um, radio DJs or, or, or you know yeah. it's a kind of having escaped. And you, you recently wrote uh, a piece called "Let the Star Architects Work All the Angles." Mm -hmm. uh, just as, a, as, a, as an aside, uh, the uh, headlines for for articles. Do you write them, or is that something? Is there a headline writer in? in the no, media? you you have nothing to do with them. I actually I've got I get much more involved in the images than most critics do because I kind of can't keep my fingers out of them because sometimes they can be so ridiculous and get things wrong. So you kind of I tend to meddle with the images, but the headlines I never kind of touch. I mean, they they you know they're written by headline writers at the copy desk, and it's, sometimes I just think of it as like a surrealist game. I mean, you see the headline and you see the story and they have nothing to do with each other and they can be just hysterically funny. And when I was younger, sometimes I'd freak out when I, when, because it had not, it was not only, it was, they could be so inaccurate. And it's the first thing anyone sees and now I just think it's funny. I mean, I don't worry about it anymore. It's well, one of the few things in terms of control with my yeah. stories I've been able to let go of. For yeah. me, that's one of the, that's when I went, I think New York, New York, the first time I read mm -hmm. the New York Times, this is, this is a top quality product. They have no idea, they, they cannot write headlines for Toffee. And yeah. I think, you know, if there's one thing we can do here, better than anyone in the world. Is headlines. Is pun. No? Yeah. Uh, is a good, uh, and the tabloids here are just masters at it. Yeah. And, and it, you know, we, what we can do in two words, uh, it seems, it takes the New York Times, I mean, the New York Times headline often is a paragraph in itself. Well, the uh, New York Times is particularly so lousy yeah. at headlines. It's <laughs> just always been really lousy at it. There are tabloids in New York that have very famous headlines that have been hilarious. I mean, Daily News used to have great headline writers. They don't anymore. The New York Post used to have great headline writers. 
But um, uh, yeah, but that's, yeah, no, it's, I would say never hold the New York Times up as a model of headline <laughs> writing. If anything, it's, what, it's one of the things that gives it this image of being so kind of uh, dowdy, hmm. you know. Yeah, yeah, it's that kind of self-importance that, you know, makes it tough for them to be very funny. Yeah. <laughs> Um, actually, I or guess. us, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> Good. We managed to uh, uh, lift the, uh, the the mood from uh, right from dour and gloom, <laughs> uh, and I think I'd like to end at that point.